Welcome to Season 4 of E-Commerce Fastlane. This podcast helps resilient entrepreneurs thrive with Shopify. And now, on to Episode 139. You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company. Powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder, and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Today's episode is brought to you by OmniSend. If you're in e-commerce marketing and it feels like those weekly newsletters are no longer enough to power your growth, you're gonna love OmniSend. With more than 3,000 five-star reviews, OmniSend is the go-to choice for nimble Shopify merchants who want to step up from regular email campaigns so you can actually start increasing your sales, not your workload. With OmniSend, you'll be launching pre-built e-commerce automation in no time as well as intuitively segmenting customers based on their shopping behavior and even trying out SMS or push notifications, all from the same platform. The best part? OmniSend provides an immediate boost to your revenue while staying as easy as drag and drop email building, with automated emails averaging up to 40% of the total email revenue. Join Duke Cannon, Black Halo, and other high-growth Shopify brands that choose OmniSend to grow their e-commerce business on autopilot. So visit OmniSend.com and start your 14-day free trial today with no credit card required. Well, hey there, it's Steve, and welcome back to the e-commerce Fast Lane podcast. Now, if this is your first time listening, this is an e-commerce show where we have honest and transparent conversations about building and thriving with your store powered by Shopify or Shopify Plus. New episodes are available twice weekly with your favorite podcast players like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, and many more. You can also uh, stream current episodes, including a very relevant back catalog of a lot of most successful Shopify partners, uh, notable ones, and the Plus certified app partners um, directly uh, from ecommercefastlane.com. Now, my guest on today's episode is Ron Jacobson, who's co-founder and CEO of a company called Rockerbox. And what they are, they're an attribution provider, and they're here to help Shopify brands in a couple different areas. They help to measure and to optimize all of the marketing uh, initiatives that a brand might be doing from paid and organic, digital to offline. Their attribution solution really does help measure all of the impact that your marketing is doing. And I think we all uh, want that sort of data and this actionable insights to be able to do that. So tons of learnings today. It's a massively hot topic. I was talking in the green room for recording today. It's a very hot topic about attribution um, and some of the craziness that's happening with Apple, with iOS 14 and the cookie list world and all this kind of fun stuff. So make sure you listen to the end of the episode also because there's a couple uh, exclusive offers that are being made available to those that want to take the platform for a spin. So, hi, Ron. Welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Hey, Steve. Thanks for uh, having me here. Excited to be uh, on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for making the time. And I kind of shared a couple questions ahead of time of our recording today because I want to make sure that I really get to share the message and the opportunity that's available to brands today because I think some people get it. Others don't get it. And so I'm hoping to kind of once and for all open the kimono and just kind of share the importance of understanding attribution, the types of attribution and why you've built this platform uh, really to help uncover a lot of this stuff. So let's dig in maybe on a high level first, just to understand what Rockerbox does and the kind of the problems that you're solving for brands. I mean, I think most fundamentally what Rockerbox does is we help brands understand the impact of their marketing. And that sounds simple, but it actually is a very complicated problem that gets more and more difficult as a brand actually scales. Things are pretty simple when you first start off your store and you're focused on maybe just Google, paid Google, maybe some paid Facebook, uh, and you feel like you can kind of keep your finger on the pulse of really what's working. But as you scale and try new channels, some hard to track channels like things like podcasts and uh, direct mail and maybe even OTT and linear TV, these like offline channels, it just gets more and more difficult to really know what the impact is of any one individual initiative. And even more, it's difficult to know how each different marketing effort is influencing your other marketing efforts. 
And that's exactly where a company like Rockerbox comes in. Our job is to be that single source of truth across all of your marketing, both paid and organic, digital and offline, and provide one location where every brand can go to to see the performance and efficacy of all their marketing channels at the campaign level, down to the ad ID level, all the way up to the channel level. So really unifying that in one location across different attribution models, across different ways of analyzing the data, but trying to give e-commerce companies a way to really keep their finger on the pulse of what's happening and how they can grow their business over time. Yeah, it sounds like the platform, from what I understand, is it really is an SOP, a standard operating procedure of people in marketing that they feel confident that the connected marketing channels that go into Rockerbox, I know there's a ton of them and you're adding a ton more. Like it's so interesting that a customer's journey is pretty wide open. That's really not top down anymore. And it's a multi-channel world. And then internationalization is creating some interesting things that are going on now too. And that's one thing I like about your platform is that it does all of that. And it just, it's a source of truth to be able to action all that data and be able to analyze it all. So Let's talk about the journey because I'm always fascinated uh, why people choose to build what they build because I think what's interesting is it's, it's more than just, hey, I want to have a SaaS company. I want to make some money. I want you know, recurring revenue. I mean, yeah, you got to pay the bills, but I believe there's, there's a lot more to it than just I want to make money and start a company. Are you able to talk about maybe the desire and the expertise just to want to get involved in this attribution kind of marketing world? When I started Rockerbox, we actually had, we were doing nothing in attribution. Uh, our first business was... Yeah, we built technology to run really efficient programmatic prospecting campaigns. And we were effectively running as kind of like a technology-based agency. We would sell into brands, we'd manage budgets for them, and some pretty big brands like your Timberlands, Vanguard, Citibanks. And what happened was when we were running marketing for them, they were kind of judging us with their single source of truth, their attribution provider. And we had to use the output of those solutions to kind of optimize our marketing because we knew that's how they were judging us. And the more and more we went through this process of running media with these brands and working with their attribution providers, these legacy kind of enterprise grade solutions, candidly, the more I realized I just didn't really like any of the products I was being forced to work with. For a host of reasons I can walk you through, both business and technical, but fundamentally, as a marketer, I just didn't want to use these tools. So just about two and a half years ago, we decided to launch a second business line to build the attribution product that we wish existed, something that was uh, simpler, faster to get up and running, more affordable, more customizable, more transparent, just what I thought a modern marketer would need. And fast forward to today, that second business line, it's overtaken Rockerbox. It's the full focus of what we're doing. We deprecated the old business line. So this is really the future of what we're, what we're building at the company. And it's really just building the tool that we wish existed. So it's kind of that classic story of wanting a product that's not there, so building it yourselves. Yeah, purpose built. I mean, that's, yeah, that's definitely uh, a recurring theme on here of, of a lot of platform builders is they kind of dabbled in, in some cases, e-commerce, notice these challenges and they said, well, we're going to build, we have the brain power and the technology to do it. We're going to build it just because this is what we believe our edge to market is going to be. And all of a sudden they see that there's a wider market than just selfishly using it for yourself. <laughs> so there's other people that could use it. So I think that's very notable and awesome. So what about some of the measurement challenges that you believe a brand has had? Because, you know, if, if, if you start out, you understand that, you know, most understand that attribution is important, but how to measure it as a brand starts to scale up. Are, are you able to kind of talk about, I, I guess that's the whole positioning of Rockerbox then. Uh, maybe you can dig into that for us today. Yeah, it's a big question. I think the measurement challenges kind of depends on the brand. It depends on their kind of their stage as an organization. You know, if you're just starting off, we kind of have the situation where I, I, I mentioned that point when companies expand beyond Facebook and Google. And what happens is inevitably they add one channel to their mix, which makes it suddenly more difficult for them to really know what's happening. You felt like you were in control with just Facebook, Google, then you launch influencers. And all of a sudden you see that the percentage of your conversions that are being attributed to organic search or direct has gone up a lot. And you don't really know why. Is it the influencer? Is it not? So all of a sudden, some clarity has become becomes a lot more vague. And that's like a really early sign of, you know, it's going to get harder and harder to measure over time. I mean, that happened just at the beginning. As uh, the brands that we work with, I mean, they're running across 20, 30 channels, some channels that don't even have the idea of an impression or a click. So it can get really, really complicated very, very fast. So uh, what we kind of see is like there, there are two types of starting points. Some brands get ahead of this, and that's it's candidly rare. It's rare for somebody to get ahead and realize this is something I'm going to need to do. Uh, there's just so much going on every day that I don't I don't blame them for that. But every once in a while, we do have a brand who goes, you know, we think that in six months this is going to be important for us. Let's lay the foundation today. More often than not, somebody's coming to us after they launch a channel. And they don't really know what the impact is. They don't know if they should be investing more or less or what have you. So that's a point where some folks will come to us and say, you know what, Rockerbox, like we, we need to pause a little bit. We need to get our ducks in a row. We need to figure out for every single channel, how do we track it? And 
can't believe they, they don't know. That's not their expertise. So they come to Rockerbox to be that, that source of knowledge for them. And uh, obviously, as they scale, it gets more and more complicated. Launching things like OTT, uh, linear TV, direct mail, like these are difficult channels and they don't have exact perfect solutions. That's, I'd say the biggest problem here is everybody's hoping for perfection. It doesn't exist with, uh, with what Rockerbox is building, but they need something. They need some way to be able to measure these tough to measure channels. And at least with Rockerboxes, they're scaling their organizations and their organizations, their channels, their spend levels. We can give them the best practice for each channel. What is the best way to measure it? What are the flaws? What are the, what are the pros? What are the cons? But it gives direction. It gives direction so they understand where they should be going and how they should be spending their budgets. There's a lot of people that are listening today that are, I mean, there's different maturity levels, obviously, of the, you know, the listeners of this podcast. And, you know, if you're to give some advice for some early stage brands, what sort of things should they kind of get, as you say, get their ducks in a row? Like, what should a brand do that are in the early parts of their journey? They got product market fit and they want to continue to grow and scale. What should they do first or second to kind of get things in order? The first thing is to keep your marketing like strategies uh, cleanly organized. And what I kind of mean by that is if you're running prospecting, make sure that you're categorizing that as prospecting. If you're running retargeting, make sure you categorize that as retargeting. Uh, I see all too often that brands are looking at, you know, they'll compare their Facebook performance, their Google performance, and the CPA of one is great and the other is really bad. But they're running different strategies in each. So that's not really an apples to apples kind of comparison. It's the little things, you know, just having the term retargeting in the campaign name or prospecting or branding, just those little things that can easily be skipped is super, super important. And most brands are doing this these days, but it's just, you need to have a connection to your customer. You need to have some way to re-engage them, ideally for free, with things like email and text are not really for free, but at least at low cost. So investing as early as you can in ways to capture that first party data, be that an email address, be that a phone number, that's just super important because you want to be able to re-engage with those customers a day, a week, a month after they've left your site. So those are kind of like the table stakes, I'd say, that will... If you do those well, you'll be well ahead of most brands. So what about uh, channels then? Because you mentioned that, you know, you have some Shopify Plus brands that are, you know, running 20 some channels and they're all over the place. But there's some early stage people that are just, hey, I'm only on a couple channels. I'm looking to expand out into one or two extra ones just to get more reach. And so what are some of the big mistakes that you're seeing when you go to launch a new brand? Let's say like OTT. And this is like going over. I did did some research. I didn't even know what OTT was until I dug into it a bit and found out, oh, okay, so video streaming and ad content over like, set-top boxes and things, smart TVs and whatnot, like separate outside of the regular networks, uh, which I know is a growing, growing area of advertisement. So just was curious to see kind of like, what are you recommending when people expand out into other channels? It's interesting. I, I, to your point, you, it's almost like we think about these earlier brands and we're almost doubtful that they would be even exploring these channels. But it's really interesting for me to see that that's not the case anymore. You're able to buy in these channels at smaller and smaller increments. Uh, Hulu has like a cell service platform now, for example, that any, any SMB can go on board and launch their own Hulu campaign. And that just wasn't the case 6, 12, 18 months ago. The biggest thing I'd recommend for anybody is just have a strategy. Have a strategy to know after you run this test if it worked. Uh, The worst thing in the world you can do is spend money and then you and your team regroup and you go, did it work or not? And you have no idea. It's fine to spend money, try a campaign and fail, but you need to learn. Uh, To spend money and not know what happened is is really the worst. So I would just say at a minimum, anytime you're launching a new channel, at least know how you internally are going to judge it. How are you going to judge whether or not it worked or not? If it succeeded, if it failed, how are you going to track it? And a really important point there is if you don't do that, what's going to happen is you're going to try to revise history. You know, you're going to say, well, this wasn't really the goal that we had for this campaign, but it turns out this happened and that's pretty good. So let's do that. It's sort of retroactively trying to make uh, the decision that you made seem like it wasn't a mistake, which I get is human nature. But I I would really just recommend you have a strategy for how to approach every campaign, every channel, every test before before you start spending dollars there. Yeah, 100 percent. Now, what about the tracking mechanism? Is there anything specifically that you're recommending to just attribute the success or failure or learnings out of a campaign? I mean, I think there's some things that are very doable uh, in-house. It's like good vanity URLs, good promo code usage, post-purchase, post-purchase surveys. Those are all great kind of low-hanging fruit methods to uh, start tracking. Uh, you're going to get to a point, though, where that's, that's just not sufficient. Now, Rockerbox, I'll say what we do is we'll, we'll ingest all that. It's That's great signal. We love to use it. But there's some point where you want to go beyond that. Uh, you're going to want to actually work with a third party, be it Rockerbox or someone else, that can properly measure that channel. Like a great example is Linear TV. If you're serving as an actual old school TV, there's no impression that occurred. There's no click that occurred. Like there's no way to deterministically know for a fact that somebody saw that ad spot. And that's where you need to do some form of modeling. You need to do some form of, I'm going to look at the aggregate data that's available. And I'm going to look to see what happened on my site. Were there more visitors? Were there more converters? And I'm going to build some models to try to determine the impact of that. 
Now, candidly, that starts to get to a level of sophistication. If you don't have data analysts in-house and you don't have access to session-based data and things like that, it's going to be pretty hard for you to do that internally. It's doable, sure, but it's going to be harder. And I think that's where working with somebody like a rocker box or channel-specific vendor, uh, vendors that are meant to attribute that specific channel is definitely the good approach. And I think that's where it starts to become just like a kind of cost-benefit analysis for each brand. You know, If you're spending $100,000 testing a new channel, it's probably worth it to invest in a solution that can make sure that you at least are tracking that test properly. Because if it works, you're going to scale and you're going to need it anyway. It's starting to recognize, I guess, when you're getting to a level of scale that it does merit working with somebody who can actually track a hard-to-track channel in the best way. Similarly, for things like OTT, for example, you mentioned uh, if you're buying on Broku or things like that, you want to be able to find uh, work with a partner who can actually ingest the log level data from what you're serving. Uh, and that's tough. You need somebody who has relationships with the publisher. You need somebody who can ingest the data, somebody who can do some, some form of identity resolution between uh, the ads that are being served and what's happening on your site. So it just, it just gets more complicated, to be frank. And I think that's exactly where someone like a rocker box can be great for brands that are scaling. I have a selfish question that I would love to get an answer to. I manage a brand. I'll keep them nameless for now, but they had a Super Bowl ad this year. Let's call it $5 million, 30-second spot. Interesting conversation about where was the aha moment to make a decision to even have that ad. And, you know, and anyways, it went down that journey. I believe they're happy, but there's going to be a post-mortem now on that particular idea of doing that ad. You as Rockerbox, and I'm sure you've had large campaigns like this where people are dropping large money for a very quick what happens with Rockerbox? Like what should happen when this ad launches? And then like, just maybe walk me through a couple things that you can think of at the top of your head now, because I think I might be able to bring that information and that knowledge back to them and saying, hey, have you thought about X, Y, and Z? They're probably not a Rockerbox customer yet, but I'm curious to say, I just dropped $5 million and I had 100,000 people hit my website literally in 30 seconds. And yes, conversion went through the roof, but then the retargeting side of it. And then how do we, like, it's just, I think it's a whole crazy conversation that I just would love to have your insight on. It's a big one because you're completely right. There's what's the you know what's the short term impact, what's the medium term impact, and what's the long term impact. Those are all kind of different conversations. On the short term impact, to your point, you want to look at at least some sort of baseline lift in visitors to your website compared to what what you normally expect. Obviously, with the Super Bowl ad, that's, that's just going to go up a ton. Things that I personally would be interested in is are those visitors net new visitors or repeat visitors? Just to get a sense of are you getting folks that are ready heard of your brand coming back, or are you actually getting you know first time folks to start to engage with you? I would also be interested, especially for a Super Bowl ad with the amount of money you're spending. I would expect conversions. Like just getting folks to my site at that point would not be sufficient, at least for me, in terms of how I'd be thinking of investing that money. So I'd look to see you know of the folks that we believe came to your site via that uh, because of that Super Bowl spot, how many converted or not. And again, this is, by the way, stepping back, it's unknowable for a fact who saw that, uh, that spot uh, and then came to your site. It's impossible to tie that deterministically. So this comes to the world of probabilistic modeling and probabilistic uh, inference that needs to happen. It's, it's always important to keep back of mind, uh, all of this is imperfect. Um, it can't be done 100% perfectly, but you can be a lot better than, than not having anything. So that's at least what I think about from a short-term perspective. Then midterm, you want to start thinking about, is there a halo impact? Is that spot having impact on your other channels? Is it leading to, for example, uh, your retargeting spend going up, your targeting budgets going up, your targeting CPMs going up or down? Is it leading to your targeting efficiency going up or down? Do you have a higher or lower long-term conversion rate? So that's kind of like, I think, the medium-term impact. Uh, I would really also be interested there in terms of if you're capturing first-party data. Like, if you're able to capture a bunch of emails and start to email the folks and get in front of them and actually re-engage for free, I think that's that's huge. So I think that's also a really important kind of short to medium-term KPI I'd be looking for for that Super Bowl ad campaign. Long term, I think you need to really look again in terms of path to conversion. So we have this whole concept of Rockerbox around uh, understanding the intersection between marketing channels. What are the various channels that are leading users to convert? What's the path between them? And this idea of uh, time to convert. So I'd be really interested to understand for folks that we believe engage with the Super Bowl spots, what does their path to conversion look like? What does their time to conversion look like? And which channels are they interacting with? Because if you can find that that is really significantly shortening that path to conversion, that could be really valuable. If you could find that it's actually making it so that people who interact with their brand through other channels, that subsequently to that second interaction, they convert more quickly, that could also be really valuable. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, maybe they saw a super ad spot, then you sent them a promotional email, and they convert more quickly than people who got that promotional email having not seen that super ad spot. So that's where comparisons um, between path to conversions can become really, really valuable. It's actually a whole view that we have in our platform where you can look at compare and contrast different path to conversions. You know, was the first touch the Super Bowl spot or was it not the Super Bowl spot? So that's going to be important long term. The last last thing is obviously looking at, okay, so uh, you, we got some folks from this spot. Some folks hopefully became customers. What does that mean long term? You know, are these people coming back? Are they coming back at a high? Uh, are they coming back and repurchasing? 
at a higher rate than most customers, at a lower rate than mo most customers. It goes into the class of like, what's the LTV of that cohort, which fundamentally is the most important thing. You know, it's not that hard to get a customer. It's hard to get a customer that's going to be LTV profitable from a lifetime value perspective. So I would be really interested to look into that cohort and understand what's happening, you know, one month out, two months out, three months out. And I know that's, that's not a perfect science, but how would they know that the uptick in traffic can definitely be attributed to that? Because I've seen it firsthand, so I know the amount of traffic that came to it and the significant conversion lift that happened on that day too. But what are all the other unknown things that, are, that have happened now because of this? So there, this event has happened. So how do we know that the path to purchase or LTV could potentially be higher or lower? Like, how do we know that if they weren't connected to Rockerbox during the, the campaign? Well, well, if you're not working with Rockerbox during the campaign, it's harder, to be frank. I mean, there, there are other vendors you can work with, but I mean, I would abstract it out. Like, let's let's kind of remove the Super Bowl example and just go to like a general example. How does one even try to gauge the impact of, of a TV ad spot? I'll give you approaches that we take. Uh, there's this concept called a post log file, which basically says it's something you'll get from your agencies that'll say, it's just a CSV saying every DMA, every location, the time and the actual uh, channel program that you serve that linear TV ad spot on. You know, maybe like Planet Earth or something like that. What Rockerbox does is we ingest those post log reports and we have to basically analyze to see at a per DMA basis, you know, in the three to five minute period after the ad spot aired, who do we see arrived on the website? And we know who arrived on your website because we literally have a pixel on your site. So we can go and see, cool, in, you know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where the TV ad spot aired from 1 to 105, which is after it aired, we'll literally see every single time that somebody came to that site in that, in, you know, in that DMA during that time period. And we know that because, again, our pixel on our website, it's pinging our servers and we can track that user. So that's literally Rockerbox looking to have uh, a touch point of that ad spot for that program and that DMA on that user's path to potential conversion. There are kind of two parts to this whole game of trying to really achieve your marketing. One is understanding what are their marketing touch points that led somebody to work. Let's construct that path to conversion, number one. The second part is cool. Now that I have that path to conversion, how much did everything actually contribute to the conversion? Did having TV on that path to conversion actually contribute? Was it actually predictive of someone's likely to convert? And that's really the two different jobs that Rockerbox has to help companies do. Construct the path and then actually evaluate each touch point in there. So as it relates going back to your original question around that Super Bowl ad spot, I would look to say, first off, just by virtue of having our pixel on their website, uh, was there a huge influx of net new visitors? You said that there was yes, which I'm not surprised by. I look to see, is it net new visitors? Are they coming direct to the site? Are they coming via organic search? Are they coming via your targeting click? Those are all ways you can use to filter it down. You know, somebody who comes to the site within two minutes of an ad spot, but, you know, the click-through URL indicates that it was from a retargeting ad, it's not likely that they came because of the TV ad spot. It's likely that they just clicked on a retargeting ad. So there are all these heuristics you can use to try to be smarter around which users we want to infer came because of that TV ad spot. And that's something that you work with, uh, you know, Rockerbox or uh, in-house to try to develop the best methodology around. I think that's also like where Rockerbox can be helpful. Like we've, we've just done this enough times that we can kind of guide you to what we believe is correct. And I think more importantly, just in terms of how we work with brands, you know, we don't care where you spend your ad dollars. I don't care if you spend more or less. So it's it's nice to have a neutral third party who can really just try to help you get the best results without us being biased and just trying to get you to spend more dollars through us. Because again, I don't we don't get paid that way, so I don't care. One thing I noticed too from this brand, they also mentioned that there was a lot of impact on social mentions that happened after the episode. So they were monitoring that. Is that something that Rockerbox can ingest to just understand intent of people searching and at mentioning and sharing and all that around that brand? It's a fair point. It's a good signal. We don't ingest that sort of data today. Well, let's take it a step further. So uh, there's more social posts, social mentions of the brands. What's the goal, though? The goal is to get those people potentially seeing that social posting, that social engagement coming to the site. So like, how could that happen? Maybe more people are going directly to the site. So do you see an uptick in direct visitors? Maybe you see an uptick in people searching your brand. So an increase in organic search, paid search. And that's also where I think leveraging promo codes, post-purchase surveys is a great way to continue to try to dive into that. Uh, a big thing Rockerbox does is we can ingest that sort of like post-purchase survey data or that promo code data to override what you may have think led somebody to your site. So for example, imagine somebody comes to your site via organic search, but then they leverage a promo code that's you know Super Bowl one, two, three. Well, we can work with the brand to say, do we want to override and not give credit to organic, but give credit to the Super Bowl ad, which would, would make sense to do given what was said. But that's kind of the level of customization and flexibility that you would want in a, you know, Rockerbox provides, but it's really important to have in any sort of measurement solution you use. I'm going to make a little pivot over to a new feature that I believe you've launched as of late. It kind of hits home for me because I'm in, obviously in the podcasting world and creator economy. I understand it's called sponsorship attribution. Are you able to tell some details about how that all works? 
Yeah, super excited about sponsorship attribution. We launched it last week. Effectively, we see more and more brands, as I mentioned, they're trying to they're trying to hedge away from Facebook and Google. If there's one common thing I see of any brand as they scale is that they don't want to be exclusively reliant on Facebook and Google, which I get. And some really great venues by which to do that is obviously podcasts and influencers. And that's where we decided to kind of start with sponsorship attribution. We're going to eventually roll it out for more, more verticals, but we call it podcast attribution, influencer attribution. Essentially, we're trying to make the best way for our clients to really understand the impact of those two channels. Now, there are a couple of things that go into that. First one is the tracking side of it. What is the best way to track those channels? There are known ways of doing it, vanity URLs, promo codes, things like that, post-purchase surveys. There are also some uh, third-party attribution providers that we work with and integrate with on um, podcast attribution. So uh, Rockerbox sitting across all channels, we actually sometimes will work with channel-specific attribution providers and adjust their data. Uh, we do that with podcasts, we do that with uh, call center tracking. But that's really one half of allocating the data in. The other part that gets really difficult, and you won't realize this is a problem until you're in the middle of it, but it's even just consolidating all of your spend. Having one location with the spend of every single one of your marketing dollars across every single channel is super, super critical. And it's relatively easy-ish to do for like the API-driven channels, like your Facebooks, your Googles, you know, you can just pull in that spend. It gets a lot harder with something like a podcast, even here. Eventually, we're going to, as we talk at the end, we have a promo coming. And that's a cost to Rockerbox, and we're happy to do it, but it's, it's a cost for us in terms of doing that promo. How do you get that cost into one consolidated view so you can actually look at the efficiency of that podcast? And that's something that we've invested a ton. The same thing happens with influencers. Oftentimes you'll pay you know, a flat rate for that influencer, plus they'll give a 10% discount, plus maybe you'll pay out a CPA to that influencer. How do you get all that cost into one location so you can actually compare that cost against the number of conversion amount of revenue that was driven? So that's what we're doing with our sponsorship attribution. Super pumped about it. Yeah, it's been getting really great reception across our customers. So yeah, really good product launch. Another, I'm going to open up a lot of can of worms here today. Um, iOS 14 is obviously on a lot of people's minds right now, this kind of cookie-less world and the sky is falling and, uh, you know, all of a sudden first party data is like the only thing that you're going to rely on. And I would just love to hear your perspective on what you understand the workarounds are and just kind of what the world's going to look like potentially sometime in 21 when, when Apple chooses to roll it out. It's been good for our inbound lead channel. I'll tell you that. So we've got a lot of folks reaching out because they're freaking out about this. So uh, selfishly, thank you, Apple. Listen, I mean, the writing's been on the roll. Uh, the writing's been on the wall for years, right? Like Apple deprecated third-party cookies around 18 months ago. Uh, they launched ITP around 24 months ago. So anybody who's surprised by this, I get it. But like, it, you know, this is bound to happen. What Rockerbox, the way that we approached it, and this is, I think, the best practice that you can do these days. The moment that Apple deprecated uh, third-party cookies in Safari, we basically just realized that third-party cookies are done. And you know, we can either keep trying to push against the wave, or we could just adapt. So. The first thing that we moved is we now work with clients in their first party cookie space capacity. When we go live with them, we're actually doing a DNS update so that we're effectively in their first party cookie space. And there are pros and cons to that. The pro is that effectively it's the best way you can track. It's the best way you can track anonymous visitors. The cons are that it makes it more difficult to be able to track things like views. Display views are tracked by using third party cookies. So that became more difficult. But similarly to how we think about linear TV where you know there's no way to know for a fact that somebody saw a TV ad and then converted, you have to model against it. Same thing is happening with third-party cookie deprecation. So I think we're basically just moving to a world where a lot more modeling-based measurements going to have to happen. And that's fine. I think that's been happening for a while. So I'm glad that Rockerbox kind of got ahead of this. We've done a similar thing with Facebook views forever. Facebook never gave impression-level data to third parties for views. And views are obviously a huge portion of Facebook. So we built out what we call synthetic events. We built that two years ago. So our clients could determine the impact of Facebook views on their marketing. And we have to do that by modeling against aggregate data that Facebook made available. So the most broad characterization, I'd say the change that folks need to become more comfortable with is working with aggregate data and trying to leverage aggregate data to be able to make smart intuitions in terms of what's happening. As it relates to the iOS 14 specific updates, we're actually fortunate for the most part, and I think for the most part, uh, the folks that are listening here are as well, most of our clients don't have apps. I mean, most e-commerce sites for the most part are not building their own app. They're obviously web-based. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the impact that pure app uh, app-based companies are feeling is, is mitigated. I'm not, this is not me trying to say there is no impact. Obviously, there are changes to reporting in Facebook and to campaign structures that can be made. There are going to be some changes in terms of app to web conversion tracking. So things are changing. I think the biggest thing I, I would say is lean into it. Like the world's not going to revert. It's not going to go backwards. You can keep your head in the sand and try to keep things the way they were as long as possible. But I think the sooner you just accept it, work on capturing first party data, work on providing value to your customer, uh, prospective customers, so they want to give you that information. Uh, the better spot you'll be. 
I also do a lot of app audits and I do recommend uh, some different solutions for those kind of in the customer experience field, just to understand the customer journey and try to find some kind of gaps and things that are going on on the website. I'm not sure if Rockerbox is part of this, but you know, different tools like Hotjar or Lucky Orange or Full Story, these are, you know, tools, active tools that can do recordings and heat mapping and uh, rage clicking and all the sort of things that are happening on page. How does Rockerbox feel about these sort of tools? And then, and do you feel that there's any analytics or any kind of information that can be pulled out of this that could potentially be actionable from within the Rockerbox platform? That's a great question. So personally, we, we use full story Rockerbox for our own application. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the product. I haven't used Hotjar or Lucky Orange, so I have no, no, nothing negative or positive to say. I imagine they're probably great tools, but uh, full story is something we use and leverage. It's actually really fun you asked that. We got a, I was in a customer testimonial, I think like last week, and they literally asked me, how can we push Rockerbox data into full story and vice versa? And I candidly didn't really understand that at first. I didn't understand what they were trying to get at. Uh, eventually, I realized what they want us to be able to do is ingest from full story basically filters. You know, somebody who came to the site and rage clicked, to, your, to use your example, let's filter to that subset of users and try to understand what marketing drove that sort of user. Is there a certain, is there anything we can tell? Is there anything correlated between the marketing initiatives and the ad dollars that are being spent and folks are coming to the site and rage clicking? Now that's kind of a weird example perhaps, but maybe alternatively, you know, is there any uh, correlation between folks who come to our site and purchase a certain type of product? Can we figure out which, you know, marketing channels are driving towards that? So it's a great product to ask and something we should be building. So what does the future look like for Rockerbox? I'm always curious what your North Stars might be for the rest of 21 or like partner alignment, new channels, uh, just innovation. Just want to get warm and fuzzy. That it Just how are you going to continue to offer value and assistance for Shopify brands? It's kind of the most important thing, obviously, for Rockerbox. Like we continually think internally in these terms around how do we retain and grow our customers. Retain is making it easier and making Rockerbox easier to use, providing more value to our customers and just making our product a better offering every single day. Grow is how do we expand with them? Our clients are going from 10 people companies with one marketer to, uh, as you mentioned, you know, companies like Figs and Bird and some, some great brands, hundreds of employees, large marketing organizations, data analysts, engineers, data scientists, operations and finance starts to want access to our data set because it becomes that single source of truth, the KPIs that they use internally. So this is hugely important to us. I think on the one hand, something that's really, really big is integrations. Our clients are buying on, buying and not, not even buying, I mean, uh, there's a lot of organic efforts as well, but they're, they're trying to acquire customers through endless channels. And to do that, we need to ingest uh, and centralize all that marketing data. So. I think we did, I don't know, 15 or so integrations in 2019. I think we doubled that in 2020. We're probably gonna double it again this year. So 60 or so integrations, we'll have 100 plus. And that's just something that has to become a core expertise for Rockerbox, and we're gonna to continue to do that. Listen, we're all busy. Everyone has too much to do. And I think more and more, we need to get to a world where we are being prescriptive with suggestions versus just providing uh, information. And it's something that we, we, we did pretty effectively with our sponsorships attribution launch. For the first time in Rockerbox, you can literally see questions and answers written out. So specific questions around like, you know, what was the change in CPA of my podcast in last week? And we can answer that out for you. So it's pretty cool technology that we've been building there and we have a lot more to invest. I'd say the last part, especially for the scaling brands, is they become more sophisticated. They become more skeptical and they have those data science teams that will question it look at our attribution models and they won't believe it. And that's fair. They should do that. They should question it. So I think for us, having a product that is transparent, that's customizable, that can work within their data data warehouses, that can get into their BI tools. Yeah, that's just what we need to do to continue to be able to scale up with our brands. And we're investing pretty heavily in there in 21. So how can people learn more about the Rockerbox solution, uh, Shopify app and all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, so rockerbox.com, obviously, uh, Rockerbox on Twitter. Uh, we have a Rockerbox Shopify app, so you know you can just go search our name. Also, if you want to email, I'm happy to chat on rockerbox.com. And uh, yeah, listen, we, we work with some great direct-to-consumer brands. We love the Shopify ecosystem, and I'm fortunate to get to talk to some of these awesome marketers all day long. So uh, always keen to learn more. And uh, yeah, if you're looking to scale your marketing mix, uh, check out Rockerbox. We can definitely help, and we should be your single source of truth. I understand that you'd like to uh, share an offer for those listening today. Yeah, uh, so we, we kind of have two different product lines. We have what we call uh, Rockerbox Starter. Uh, that's for companies that are earlier in their life cycle. And uh, we're going to extend a 50% discount for the customer signing up for Rockerbox Starter for two months. We also have our main offer in Rockerbox, uh, which is more for companies that are in the scaling mode. They're kind of well beyond Google and Facebook. We're going to waive onboarding fees for anybody who comes, obviously, through this program to Rockerbox. So yeah, check it out. 
Beautiful. So it'll be ecommercefastlane.com forward slash rocker box. That'll go to a landing page that you'll be able to take that offer up. And, you know, once again, I just wanted to thank you for, for coming on the show. I always enjoy kind of point blanking a few, a few questions. There was a couple selfish questions in there, but it just, I think it makes for great conversation just to, you know, like we're all on the front lines. There's, there's lots of stuff going on right now. And it's just, I think it's really important for those that, uh, that are listening today that, you know, attribution is super important. There's ways that you can set yourself up for success today by understanding attribution, understanding how it impacts your marketing overall. Rockerbox sounds like an incredible solution. It's very clear when you have like large brands, like you said, like Rothy's and Figs and Roan. And there's, I mean, there's a, there's a massive amount of brands. I do a lot of app audits. So I get to see a lot of these connections that are in inside these, you know, premium Shopify brands. And so it's very, very exciting. Thank you again, Ron, for coming on the show. I just really appreciate you sharing uh, your knowledge and your vision and, you know, giving back to the Shopify ecosystem. Yes, Steve. No, this has been great. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. All right. Have a great day. E-commerce fast lane is brought to you by OmniSend. OmniSend is an email and SMS marketing platform built for nimble Shopify merchants who want to increase their sales and not their workloads. Full Shopify integration, pre-built automation workflows, intuitive segmentation, and no code editing makes it easy to get up and running without diving into the nitty gritty details, unless you want to. More than 50,000 e-commerce brands use OmniSend to grow their businesses on autopilot converting their customers with quick to build, highly relevant emails and texts. So visit Omnisend.com, start your 14 day free trial today with no credit card required. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.